Good morning and happy Sabbath, Manassas. Welcome to the winter of 2022. Wow, what a surprise. And let me tell you, this morning has been a surprise too. Uh, as some of you online have noticed, we've had a little bit of technical difficulty. We are operating on a skeleton staff, and um, it seems like Satan has been trying to throw a roadblock here or there, but thank you for sticking with us. And uh, we're going to let God win this one. Amen? Amen? So you just hang in there, and God is going to be with us. But uh, talk about surprises. The weather has been a surprise, wasn't it? Uh, last Sunday, believe it or not, I was in a t-shirt outside in 65 degree weather taking down my Christmas lights at home. The next day, Temperatures dropped below 20, and we got seven inches of heavy, wet snow. You guys all know what I'm talking about because you got it too. <laughs> what a change, right? And uh, I guess Mother Nature, if you could go to the next slide for me, my clicker doesn't seem to be working. Mother Nature had a few New Year's resolutions of her own. Uh, she decided to give us a real winter with snow. I know that many kids were very happy uh, with what happened because this last week they got a full week off of school. And they got to go out and play in the snow. I mean, every kid's dream, right? And I hope that the rest of you were safe. And I hope that you were able to stay warm. I know several people lost power, several for up to four days. And I know others had trees break and things like that. But from what I've heard, at least I don't believe anybody has lost their life. Praise God. So we're going to praise him anyway. Amen? Last week we started off the new year with a sermon on transformation. And we are going to be, over the next few weeks, going through this series on transformation. And I'm borrowing thoughts from Rick Warren's series on transformation. And I thought, what a great sermon series to start off a new year with on how God can transform our lives. Amen? Because as we start a new year, we should want to dig into God's word and set some God-honoring goals for being transformed into the people God wants us to be. And our key thought for this series is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, in this verse, God is warning us of what might take place in our lives if we're not careful. If we are not vigilant, we will slowly conform to the pattern of this world. Last week we noticed that if we are not setting intentional goals for our life, then by default we are allowing other people to set goals for our lives, which could get us off course. Their goals could pressure and conform us into doing things that maybe we don't want. And unfortunately, at times, we're even unaware that this is taking place. Let me give you an example of how this might happen. In October of 2019, an officer of the cargo ship Priscilla took his turn at the helm so that the captain could go down below deck and get some much-needed rest. As he took his turn, the captain said, look, I have set us on a course, just maintain this course. The officer says, no problem, I can do that. But after this officer had been maintaining this course for a little while, he kind of got bored. And he thought, you know, this is a routine run. So he switched the ship onto autopilot, and then he started watching YouTube videos on his phone. Two hours later, he looks up, and there in front of him are two islands. It's a little bit concerning. And in a panic, he looks 
at the ship's radar and he sees these two islands, but it looks like there's a clear path between them. And so he decides, I'm going to go between the two islands. Unfortunately, the radar didn't show that there was a shallow reef between the two islands. Now, had he been doing his job, had he been diligent, he was supposed to consult navigational charts, and those navigational charts showed there was a shallow reef between the two islands. But he was in a panic. So he starts going between the two islands. As he approaches, he gets two radio calls from land that tell him, veer south, you're headed for rocks. But he's in a panic. The captain had set a course, but he had veered off. And so he goes between the two islands and voila, they get a shipwreck. They run up on this shallow reef. Had he stayed to the captain's course, when the captain told him, stay to this course, the captain had put them on a course that would have taken them south of those islands. But he got lazy and he switched the ship to autopilot. And over the course of the next two hours, it veered them just enough so that it took them directly to those islands they were trying to avoid. Now, when he saw the islands, if that point he would have admitted his mistake and ran down and woke up in the captain, they could have avoided this. But instead, this officer was a little bit embarrassed. You probably know that feeling, right? And he was trying to fix his mistake, so he looked at the radar, but he didn't consult the navigational charts. He ignored the calls from land because he was stressed and he was in panic folks i think we all can relate to this officer a little bit we know from experience it's easy to get distracted in life isn't it <clears throat> it's easy to coast or to switch over to autopilot and satan has a thousand and one things to distract us and get us off course and that's why we need a compass and a map for our lives God has sent us the Holy Spirit to guide us like a compass. God has given us the Bible as a map to keep us on track, but we have to be vigilant on our journey toward heaven or we will get distracted and we could make a shipwreck of our life. That's why we must constantly consult with Captain Jesus. That's why we must constantly listen to the Holy Spirit as our compass. And that's why we must always be reading our Bible, the reliable map that will chart a course for our lives. Amen? But you know, we can get off course. And Jesus shares with us a parable about how this can happen. But he also tells us how we can recover from the shipwrecks in life. This parable is found over in Luke chapter 15, verses 11, 24. It is the parable of the prodigal son. Let's see what lessons we can learn from this parable. <clears throat> it says, Jesus told him this story. A man had two sons, and the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. And so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later... This younger son packed all of his belongings and he moved to a distant land and there he wasted all of his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed his pigs. And the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. And when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, You know, at home, even my hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. You could go to the next slide for me, please. So I will go home to my father and I will say, Father, <clears throat> I have sinned. I have sinned against you and against heaven. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But if you'll please take me on as a hired servant. And so he returned home to his father. 
<clears throat> and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming and filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son and he embraced him and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring out the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger. Put sandals on his feet and kill that calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead, but now he has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. It's a great story, isn't it? This is a story, though, that shows us our humanness. It shows how often in times we drift off course in life. Now, in this story, we see a young person who is distracted, been lured into the world's way of thinking. Kind of sounds like he switched over to autopilot so he could binge watch some Netflix or YouTube videos. And those shows made it look like the world's ways were much more appealing than dad's ways there on the farm. And his natural bent is towards self. That's our all, all of our natural bents, Right? And he desired the world's good life. He had been conformed to the world's way of thinking by watching those shows. And he thought that was the good life. That's where it's at. And so one day he went to his father and he said, Father, will you give me my share of the inheritance? Now? Now, I want you to see that the autopilot of the world is based in selfishness. Now, in his mind, the son was only asking for what was rightfully his, or should be his, someday. But he was asking for it now. Even though the father might need it in the future, he wanted his share now. Folks, selfishness is at the center of autopilot. And at times we have all sat in that seat, haven't we? Many times you and I have even said, God, I want this and I want it now. And if you don't give it to me, I'm going to go out and buy it anyway. Even if I have to take out a loan. Even if I have to run up my credit card, I want it. And I want it now. Does that situation sound familiar to anyone? You know, God will allow us to make bad choices for our lives. He will not force us to stay to his course in life. He allows us to switch over to autopilot and follow the goals of the world, which at times could make a shipwreck of our lives. And it did for this young man. I want you to notice what happened. He took his inheritance and he went off to the big city and he squandered it in living the good life, right? And according to the world standards, he did live the good life for a while. I mean, he had a luxurious apartment. He bought himself some really nice clothes. He did some fine dining and he had some really good looking women. He was living the good life. The problem is all those things burn through money really fast. And without any thought for the future, he quickly burned through his inheritance. And then the Bible says a famine hit the land. We're kind of in a pandemic now, aren't we? And in a panic, this young man looks up as disaster is staring him in the face. The beautiful women are gone. He has now been evicted from his apartment. He's living in the street. He's eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. But he's too embarrassed to go home. That would hurt his pride. I mean, after all, didn't he tell his dad when he left home, Dad, I'm going to go and make it big in the big city. You'll see, I'm going to live the good life. But the Bible tells us, that when that famine hit, it was hard to find work. 
And so this young man goes out looking, but he doesn't have a lot of experience. And finally he realizes, I do have experience at working on the farm. And so he decides to get a job on a farm. But the only farmers in the region are pig farmers. He's a Jew. Jews aren't supposed to mix with pigs. But it's all there is. So he takes the job rather than go home. <clears throat> but it seems like even this job didn't pay very well because he didn't even have enough money to eat decently. And one day while he's feeding the pigs, he's looking down in the bucket and he says, what? Look at that. They're throwing away perfectly good food. Man. And so he reaches down into the scrap bucket and he pulls out the scraps. And he starts eating the pig's food. And while he is there munching on the pig scraps, the Bible says he finally comes to his senses. I would sure hope so. If you're eating pig scraps, I would hope you would come to your senses. Amen? Amen. But unfortunately, this story is about us. You see, sometimes we head down our own path in life. We leave the course that God has put us on, and we switch over to the autopilot of the world, and we tell ourselves, I know what I'm doing. This is going to be fun. The world has this plan, and if I follow it, then I'm going to be successful. And a few other lies that the world has told us, we buy into that. But one day we wake up to find ourselves in a mess. Our life is a shipwreck. And we're a long way from home. Folks, this is a story about the human condition. This is a story we can all relate to. Because at times we've all chosen our way over God's way. And at times we've all come to our senses and we have realized, man, I've made a real mess of my life. But then what can we do? How can we get our lives back on track? How can we be reconciled with the Father? The good news is that this parable tells us how we can get our lives back on track when we've made a shipwreck of things in our lives. And this parable gives us four keys for getting back on track with God. And the first key is that we need to wake up. We need to wake up like the officer on the ship and the young man in this story. We need to wake up and look around us and take an honest assessment of our lives and where we are and if we've wandered off track. If you want to be transformed in your spiritual life, then you've got to wake up and you've got to look around and you've got to admit, I have drifted off course. But more than that, You've got to get fed up with yourself and the decisions you've made that brought you to this place in your life. A little side note on uh, the connection card that I ask you to look at. There's one little place down there earlier in the next steps that says, send me a spiritual assessment form if you want to take a spiritual assessment of your life so you don't end up like this young man here. Then you can check that box and turn it in later. Too bad this young man didn't have it because he didn't wake up or get fed up until he was pulling scraps out of the pig bucket and munching on them. But you know what? Often that's the way it is with us too. Often we are so blinded by our own selfish ambitions and desires that it isn't until we have made a shipwreck of our lives that we come to our senses. You know, like the prodigal son, many times we have taken a course in life that has caused us to lose our job or lose our possessions or maybe even lose our spouse or our family. And then, only then, do we wake up and come to our senses. And let me tell you, that is a hard place to wake up in. Amen? 
the Bible says. He finally came to his senses. Folks, I'm going to here let you know today, that is the place where transformation starts. That's the beginning point. When you finally come to your senses, it isn't until you come to your senses, it isn't until you are willing to admit, I have got off course. It isn't until you're willing to admit, my life is a mess. It isn't until you're willing willing to say, God, how did I get here? There's got to be better, something better than this for my life. God, would you please show me your plan? Folks, That's the beginning of the transformation road. You know, in Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of my favorite verses. You know, I know the plans that I have for you. Right after that, I want you to notice what God says. He says, in those days when you pray, what days? Those days when you wake up from the shipwreck of your life. In those days when you pray, what does God say? I will listen to you. Isn't that good news? When you look up from the shipwreck of your life, you can know God will listen to you if you look up and pray. And he says, if you look to me wholeheartedly, you will find me. You see, when we come to our senses, the best thing we can do is look up and pray. Amen? And seek God with our whole heart. And here is God's promise. If we get serious about seeking him with our whole heart, if we start praying and and looking in the word and asking God to show us his plan, he says he will show it to us. And folks, that is the starting point of our transformation. Let's see how it worked for this young man in our story. The Bible says, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. But here I am dying of hunger. I'm going to go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Would you please take me on as a hired servant? Folks, step one is to wake up to our situation and get fed up with it. Step number two in the transformation process is to own up to our sins. You see, once this young man came to his senses, he said, this is crazy. Why am I living like this? This is not the good life that I was thinking about. My father's servants are even living a better life than I am. I would be better off as a servant in my father's house than I am now. And the Bible says he owned it. He owned up to his situation. And he said, I have sinned. I have sinned against God and against my father, and look how I have squandered his wealth. Look at me. Maybe if I go back and beg for forgiveness, maybe my father will allow me to work as one of his servants. Maybe he'll let me be hired on just as a servant because compared to where I am, my father's servants are living the good life. This is not it. Folks, that's stage two of the transformation process. Owning up to and admitting our mistakes. Admitting that our way is not the right way or the best way. That living apart from God only leads to heartache and ruin. I mean, what were we thinking of? Our sins have led us far away from God... And made a shipwreck of our lives. And we've got to own up to it. We have to take responsibility for it. Like the prodigal son, we've got to own our mistakes. And admit this is not the good life. And we need to go back to God and we need to say, God, would you please forgive me? Will you please accept me as a servant 
and own your sin. Don't try to make excuses. Don't try to blame other people. Take responsibility for your actions before God. And when you do, what do you think God's response is going to be to you? You think he's going to say, it's about time. Why don't you get down and grovel for just a little bit? Is that the way God treats us? Definitely not. I want you to notice how God responded to David when David owned up to his sin of adultery and then murder in his tryst with Bathsheba. That was something terrible, right? But I want you to notice David here as he owns up to his sin. This is in Psalm 51 verses 1 through 4. David says, have mercy on me, O God, because of your what? Unfailing love. Because of your great what? Compassion. He knows God has great love. He knows he has great compassion. Blot out the stain of my what? He admits it. I have sinned. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. Another way of saying that is I take ownership of my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Have you ever had your your sins and your mistakes haunt you and you play them over and over again? That's Satan trying to do that, by the way. David says, against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done evil. In your sight. And you will be proved bright by what you say. For your judgment against me is just. David admits it. But he doesn't stay there beating himself down. We're going to move on to verses 7 and 8. Where David claims God's promise. And he knows what God is going to say back to him. And this is what God says back to him in verses 7 and 8. I will purify you of your sins, and you will be clean. I will wash you, and you will be whiter than snow. I will give you joy again. Even though you were break, broken, now you can rejoice. Folks, isn't that good news? Isn't that beautiful? The good news, it doesn't matter what we have done. It doesn't matter how far we've wandered from home. It doesn't matter how we've made a shipwreck of our lives. God is willing to forgive us and wash us whiter than snow. And I want you to look at the father in today's story. So he, the son, returned home to his father and while he was still a long way off his father saw him coming let's pause there for just a moment it says while he was a long way off his son was what was he knocking at the front door where was he the father had his telescope out While he was a long way off, the father saw him coming. God is watching for us. Now, some people say, yeah, he's watching so he can bang me over the head when I make a mistake. I don't think so. God is not out to condemn you. He is watching so he can see, when can I rescue him? When is he going to be open to my love and my forgiveness? When is he going to turn and start my direction? Because then I can go out and get him. And I want you to notice what the father does. The Bible says he is filled with love and compassion. He runs out. He doesn't wait for him to get to the front door. He runs down the road towards his son. He embraces him in a hug. He gives him a kiss. Let me ask you, does that sound like an angry, condemning father to you? No. That is a father who is filled with love for his son. Folks, God loves you. He doesn't rejoice in your failures, but in your return. Amen? God is just looking for you to return, to come home, to accept his love and forgiveness. That's what he is wanting. So why not return to God today? God is waiting to lavish goodness upon you if you will only Come home. 
When the son returns home, the father calls to his servants, hey, get out here and put shoes on my son's feet. Bring out that best robe that we have in the house. Cover his rags. Put the signet ring back on his finger because my father is, my son is home. Let me tell you, these are not the actions of an angry father. But of a grateful father, grateful that his son finally came to his senses and came home. Which leads us to the third key of transformation, which is we need to offer up our lives to God. You know, when the son left home, what did he say? He said, give me. Give me my share. I want it now. But when he returned, what did he say? Make me. Make me a servant. Did you see the transformation in his heart? When he left home, he was self-serving and self-seeking. When he came back, he was ready to serve. He was ready to accept obedience. Folks, this is the transformation that only God can do in our hearts. And it doesn't happen overnight. And it's not easy. We may stumble and fall. We may mess up hundreds of times. But if we will keep getting back up. And if we will keep going back home. God will help transform our hearts. Amen. Going back to our key verse over there in Romans. But this time let's start with verse 1. And I want you to listen very carefully. What precedes our key verse. Of don't conform to the world. Listen to what precedes it. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's what? His mercy. Why are we talking about God's mercy? In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. When you realize what God has done for you and his great love for you, And how you've messed up your life and yet how he's willing to take your you back. This is what we should be doing. Offering up our lives as a living sacrifice. As a servant. Like the son we should be saying make me a servant. Change me father. Recreate in me a clean heart. Folks that is transformation. But it only happens when we reach the point where we're willing to say, I'm tired of going my own way. Lord, I'm willing to submit to your way. Please change me. Folks, are you willing to change your life? Are you willing to surrender your will to God's will? Then today I encourage you to surrender your life to him. You know, God doesn't hold a grudge for all the stupid stuff that you've done in your life. And let me tell you, I've done plenty of stupid things. But I can guarantee you, God is ready to lavish upon you all of his blessings. In fact, he's ready to throw a party in your honor because this child of his has come to their senses and they have finally come home. Yes, his child, he knows, has learned some hard lessons. This child has made a shipwreck of his life, has some scars to bear. But God is happy when they come home. And so here in this story, the father throws a party for his son. And folks, here is the fourth key of the transformation process. Once we've received God's forgiveness, once we have experienced his love and grace, once we have been in his presence, we need to lift up our voices in praise. Amen? Because a life is a celebration once we experience God's transformation. I'm going to repeat that again because I want you to hear it. Life can be a celebration once we experience God's transformation. Can you say amen? Amen. We need to celebrate God's goodness in our lives. 
We need to sing his praises to the ends of the earth. Because he has thrown a party over us. Really, we should be the ones throwing a party over his goodness and his love and his mercy. Amen? And I want you to notice that this father threw a celebration at his son's return. Now, let me tell you what the son was expecting when he came home. He was expecting his father's condemnation, not his father's celebration. But that's our God, amen? That's the type of God we serve. We expect condemnation. He throws a celebration. And that is the beauty of this parable. It shows those of us in the human condition, and that's all of us, it shows us the way back home. When we've wandered off course, when we've made a shipwreck of our lives, you see, the son left home saying, give me. I want what the world has to offer. But then when those decisions made a shipwreck of his life, and when he chose the t path of transformation, then he chose to wake up to his situation and get fed up to where his decisions had landed him. He chose to own up to his sins. He admitted that he had sinned, that it was his fault that he was where he was. He had disobeyed God. He had wandered off course. He had hurt other people. And he owned up to it instead of making excuses and blaming others. And then thirdly, he offered up his life as a servant. He came back to his father and said, Father, please just make me a servant. Because now he saw his father in a different light. And he was ready to serve and obey. And finally, he lifted up his voice in praise. I can tell you, as he was there at the party, and everyone was happy that he was home, I'm sure he stopped everything for a moment. He says, I have to share a testimony. When I left home, I thought it was right, but I ended up being wrong. When I came home, I was afraid of what I might meet, but my father, he ran down the road and he threw his arms around me and he gave me his own coat and he put his own shoes on my feet and he put the ring back on my finger. He loved me and I love him and I'm glad to be home. Folks, that can be your story too. I encourage you to take these same steps of transformation in your own life. Wake up. Look at the situation that is around you. Where are you? Have you switched your life over to the autopilot of the world? Are you drifting off course? Are you about to make a shipwreck of your life? Or maybe you already have. Take an inventory of your life. On your connection card today, there's a part there that says, send me the spiritual assessment survey. I encourage you to take that so that you don't have a shipwreck of your life. I also encourage you to own up to your sins. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is just waiting for us to turn to him and ask. He is willing to forgive. Thirdly, I hope that you will offer up your life to God as a living sacrifice. Ask him to show you his plans for your life. And in your connection card, there's a next step that says, send me a seven-day devotional. I have written a seven-day devotional that will help you start to get back on track with God. And then fourthly, you can lift up your voice in praising God. I want you to throw a celebration party for what God has done for you in your life. And that includes singing songs to him. Now, I know there's not a lot of people here singing today. And I know you couldn't sing very well when you couldn't hear on the service earlier. But I want you singing. And I know my dad used to joke. He said, yeah, I sing good as a tenor. Ten or eleven miles away. You know, God doesn't say, give me your best voice. He says, make a joyful noise. Sometimes my dad would sing, yeah, I even sing bass sometimes. Yeah, down in the basement. No, God wants you in his sanctuary singing his praises. And he says, make a joyful noise. 
Anytime you praise God, that's a joyful noise to him. Because he, it shows him what's in your heart. So I encourage you to sing his praises with a joyful heart. And I encourage you this new year to start off by coming home to the Father. And if you'd like to come by the, the church and, and get a communion packet for you and your family, we will have that here for you. Just come home. The Father wants you to come home to Him. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we want to thank you because there is no one else like you. You are loving, compassionate, good. And there is no good life apart from you. Yes, the world has tried to make us believe that there's good life in the glitz and the glamour and the glitter. But we know from experience that having followed that course, it only leads to shipwreck and heartache. Lord, help us to stay on course. Help us to take an honest evaluation of where we are spiritually. Help us to realign our course with your roadmap in the Bible. To set some God-honoring goals for this year. And then to faithfully offer up our lives as a living sacrifice and follow the direction of your Holy Spirit. Keep us on track. And we will sing your praises. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.